Hello, class. Welcome to REL 140, um, week six. This is the lecture recording for February 27th. Um, this is, is our sixth week, but I um, this is the fifth lecture because we had the midterm last week. So I am in the process of grading the midterms. Uh, it may take a couple of weeks. If you want to know your grade, then uh, feel free to ask in the email and I'll respond to you once I have it graded, but uh, uh, it'll probably take me a couple of weeks. So uh, if you need it before then, let me know, but hopefully you can wait a couple of weeks. Anyways, we'll begin the lecture for today. Um, this is our lecture five. We'll have the lecture today and two more lectures, and then we'll have the midterm um, in three weeks. All right, so let me open the lecture notes. All right, so today we'll be covering chapter 10. We'll be starting with chapter 10, which is about Ezekiel, prophet of restoration and hope. The plot of this book of the Bible, God explains to Ezekiel why Jerusalem falls, then promises to restore the people, the monarchy, and Jerusalem. Let's begin with the introduction. Like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel comments on the sin and judgment of Israel. However, Ezekiel also encourages the people immediately before and after the nation's defeat. He offers hope of God's continued love for the people and a brighter future. Ezekiel is taken to Babylon in 597 BC in the second deportation of Jews before the Great Exile, Ezekiel does not experience directly Jerusalem's fall, but does mourn the event. Ezekiel seems to have a fairly good life in exile in Babylon as a priest and respected community member, but he is made a sign of mourning to come when his wife dies before Jerusalem's fall. The exiles wrestle with some fundamental theological issues. First, they face the potential of losing their national identity and spiritual distinctiveness by adopting Babylon's lifestyle and religious beliefs. Second, the people wonder if God still cares for them and if they have a future. Third, many consider whether their God is more powerful than the gods of Babylon. Fourth, they question the reason for their exile, even blaming the exile on the sin and incompetence of their elders. God calls Ezekiel to address these issues. He ministers around 593 to 571 BC, correcting, comforting, and informing the Jews in Babylon, preaching sermons, and performing symbolic acts. He also has highly unusual visions that relate to Israel's questions. What he sees, says, and does make him a creative and powerful prophet. Let's look at Ezekiel 1 through 3, the prophet's call. Ezekiel's call experience is more unusual. When Ezekiel is 30 years old, God shows him a vision of four angelic creatures emerging from a storm with heels following or wheels following them. Ezekiel next receives a vision of Yahweh sitting on a throne high above the angels. He then hears a voice that gives him instructions. Most likely, the vision of the angels and wheels indicates that God is present everywhere and sees everything. Thus, the Lord sees the people of Israel wherever they go. Ezekiel is given a task that involves five commissions. First, he is being sent to a rebellious people that will refuse to listen, but he must preach regardless of the people's response. Second, the Lord tells the prophet that the people will be poor listeners, rejecting his messages. Third, God's spirit sends him back to the other exiles and will control his future activities. Fourth, Ezekiel is to be a watchman, warning the wicked to change and challenging the righteous to remain faithful. Fifth, God initially strikes Ezekiel dumb, so the prophet will remember to preach only God's word. Ezekiel serves the all-powerful and 
all-seeing creator of the universe, what they call to speak only what God tells him. His task will be difficult, but God will enable him to fulfill his ministry. We'll turn now to Ezekiel chapters 4 through 24, sermons about Judah. From Babylon, Ezekiel begins to preach about his homeland, as well as performing symbolic acts that illustrate Jerusalem's future destruction. Yahweh also asks the prophet to preach to a symbolic audience the mountains that are the high places for idols, which will be demolished and their worshippers slain. The prophet also has visions that explain why God will punish Jerusalem. He sees a scene in Jerusalem with idols in the temple and people worshipping a variety of pagan gods. Yahweh cannot allow such sin. Ezekiel sees God's glory leave the temple. God has deserted the nation that has deserted its covenant Lord. Ezekiel hears Yahweh say that Israel's leaders will be punished for killing the innocent. Yet God will eventually gather Israel from exile, give the people the desire to obey him, and restore his glory to Jerusalem. Thus, Ezekiel also preaches hope. Ezekiel alternates between preaching sermons and performing symbols to depict the future exile. He condemns false prophets for failing to warn the people to repent, and he condemns the people and nation for their sin and idolatry, though all who repent may be forgiven. Because no change occurs, judgment, may, or judgment will come. <laughs> Yahweh illustrates Israel's sin by comparing the nation to an unfaithful wife, though Yahweh had cared for her when she was an abandoned child. Therefore, God will send Babylon, which is illustrated by an eagle, to destroy Israel, though later he will restore the Jews to their land. Those already in exile blame their ancestors for their difficulties. God rejects this claim, stating that each person gets fair and equal treatment. Unfortunately, this means punishment for most Jews. Jerusalem's sins have become as wicked as those of Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom, including killing innocent people, idolatry, and political corruption. Both cities are compared to sisters engaged in prostitution, desiring nations that abuse them and looking for new lovers. God must put an end to their embarrassing conduct, so he decrees that Babylon will destroy them. God then tells Ezekiel that his wife will die, but he may not mourn or weep. This will illustrate Judah's loss of Jerusalem. Um, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel offers Israel the opportunity to repent. As he lives in a foreign land after Jerusalem's destruction, he must find new ways to minister to his people. We'll turn now to Ezekiel chapters 25 through 32, doom for Israel's enemies. Like the previous prophets, Ezekiel also pronounces God's judgment on the nations, including Egypt, Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia, for their malice and hatred toward the Jews. Tyre receives the harshest criticism, possibly due to its pride in its scenic beauty, military security, political status, and international trading reputation. Prideful cities must bow to Yahweh. These prophecies about the nations reinforce Ezekiel's comments about God's universal presence. Thus, not even Jerusalem's defeat can erase the fact that Israel's God rules the earth. And now we turn to Ezekiel chapters 33 through 48, future glory for Israel. Ezekiel's vision for Israel's transformation may be the greatest of all the prophets. He sees a future people, temple, and capital that exceed in greatness any period in Israel's history. The early problems Ezekiel announced also are reversed. First, God again calls Ezekiel to be Israel's watchman, responsible for warning Israel to repent, and considered faithful for delivering his message, regardless of the people's response. Second, the Lord pledges to give Israel new leadership. Third, 
Israel's old enemies will harm them no more. Fourth, Ezekiel now offers hope to the mountains, which will no longer serve as places for idols, but will instead bear fruit for the people. With these obstacles removed, Ezekiel envisions greater signs of Israel's renewal. He sees a valley full of dry bones, which then are transformed into a great army and restored to life. God explains that the bones represent Israel and that he will um, reassemble the nation and return the people to their land. God also describes enemies being defeated, specifically one named Gog, from the land of Magog. While it is impossible to determine Gog's identity, the point is that God will secure the restored nation in the land, and whoever invades will suffer defeat. In this way, all nations will see God's greatness and holiness, and the whole world will experience restoration. Ezekiel also envisions a glorious and restored Jerusalem with a new and larger temple and altar used for proper sacrifices. The priests in this new temple will be pure and will teach the law correctly, and the important religious practices will be observed. A life-giving river will flower from the altar, or will flow from the altar, and the city will be named Yahweh is there. God's presence in Jerusalem will make all this happen. Scholars debate whether Ezekiel's vision is meant to literally describe the historical situation after the exile until the time of Jesus, or whether the visions are symbolic of heaven or the end times. In either case, God will provide this place for all who trust in him, a new Jerusalem where God will live with his people. All right, so conclusion. Ezekiel's messages informed and encouraged the exiles of his day. They explained why Jerusalem fell and why the exiles should keep their faith in Yahweh. The people have committed religious, sexual, and societal sins, and God holds them responsible for their sins. Yet God will be with them wherever they go. He stresses a future restoration to a people facing a dismal present situation. All right, we turn now to chapter 11, the book of the 12, Partners in Prophecy. So the plot for these books, Israel and the nations have sinned against God and one another. They must therefore face the day of Yahweh. God restores Israel in the land and offers salvation to the nations. Let's look at the introduction. While the English Bible considers the minor prophets 12 separate books, the Hebrew Bible counts them as a single book. The 12 emphasize sin, punishment, and restoration in some creative ways. The first six prophecies focus on Israel's and the nation's sin. The next three stress the punishment of sin on the day of the Lord. And the final three stress the restoration of Israel and their neighbors. The twelve also portray fascinating characters. Yahweh is portrayed as a father, husband, king, and judge. The prophets range from being obedient to rebellious to intellectually inquisitive. Israel is seen both as a God-fearing minority and a sinful and stubborn majority. New insights on prophecy can be seen by reading these 12 prophecies as a whole. The 12 also contain historical details and theological themes not found in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They describe Israel before Isaiah's time and after the people returned from exile. They also ask theological questions and show that God's love extends even to enemy people. The literary and theological richness of the Twelve can be seen more fully as a group than as separate books. The Twelve Prophecies also are grouped according to thematic emphasis rather than in chronological order. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah focus on sin. Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah focus on punishment. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi focus on restoration. Let's look at Hosea, 
Israel's adultery. Hosea's ministry to the northern kingdom lasts from 752 to 724 BC. During this time, both the northern and southern nations enjoyed political security and economic growth with the long reigns of the kings Jeroboam II and Uzziah. Yet the people proved unfaithful to Yahweh as they broke the covenant by worshiping idols. Hosea preaches almost exclusively in northern Israel, though his message could also be applied to Judah. All the people have committed idolatry and will face punishment. Let's look at Hosea chapters 1 through 3. Israel's adultery dramatized. God uses Hosea's marriage to illustrate Israel's sin. Yahweh commands the prophet to marry an adulterous wife, Gomer, and have children of adultery to highlight the fact that Israel has committed spiritual adultery by worshiping other gods. Scholars debate whether Goma was, Gomer was a prostitute before Hosea married her, or whether she became unfaithful to him later, as well as whether the woman described in chapter 3 is Gomer or a different woman. Similar to the signs performed by other prophets, the action Yahweh asks Hosea to do is seemingly unthinkable. After Hosea marries Gomer, she bears children that are given symbolic names. The name of the third child means illegitimate or not my people, indicating that the people of Israel have acted like they are not Yahweh's people. A close reading of the text will show that Gomer has been unfaithful to Hosea, and it seems the last two children may not have been fathered by Hosea. Just as Hosea complains of Gomer's unfaithfulness, God expresses the same sentiment about Israel's unfaithfulness, identifying with a spurned husband. However, Yahweh and Hosea later reclaim their wives. After Gomer sells herself into prostitution, Hosea buys her back in order for her to be faithful to him and reject other men. In the same way, God will restore Israel and the people will be faithful to him and renounce idols. Hosea suffers more personal humiliation than any other prophet. His obedience to God costs him dearly. His experience illustrates the humiliation Yahweh suffers when the covenant people worship idols. Both God and Hosea pay a large price to redeem their straying spouses. Let's look at Hosea chapters 4 through 14. Israel's adultery detailed. The rest of the book demonstrates Israel's spiritual adultery through a series of alternating speeches in which God and the prophet dialogue. For example, God charges Israel with specific sins, concluding with adultery. Hosea then warns Judah to avoid Samaria's adultery, giving up hope for Samaria's repentance. Israel's descent into sin continues to be described as adultery, which will lead to its destruction. The nation's fate is described as reaping the whirlwind, for it will face exile and the end of its prosperity. Despite Israel's covenant breaking, God continues to love his people and will restore his fallen spouse, meaning the nation, after the coming punishments. Though Hosea performs a difficult sign, it illustrates God's willingness to do a similar act. Uh, as Hosea illustrates God's love and restoration, of the people before Assyria conquers the northern kingdom. This sequence of events could have been avoided if Israel had kept the covenant. We'll turn now to Joel, <laughs> prophet of apathy and cruelty. It is difficult to determine Joel's date. Its range could be the 800s through the 300s. Its emphases on Israel's religious apathy and the nation's cruelty give it a similar theme to Hosea. Joel prophesies after a locust plague devastates the land, 
he warns that Israel needs to repent before something worse happens to it. The people are called to mourn and fast, being warned of a great army that will be like a locust plague. If the people repent, God will forgive them, deliver them, and restore the land. God also promises to give his spirit to all people, giving all the power or giving all to all people the power to prophesy. In the New Testament book of Acts, Peter claims this promise is fulfilled with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the new church at the day of Pentecost. After the day of judgment, God will punish Israel's neighbors for selling Israelites into slavery and robbing Israel. God will arm Israel and destroy the nations in battle, and Israel will be his special people. Joel portrays Israel's sin in broad terms. He says the people do not care about their sin. They display apathy and unfaithfulness. He also portrays the nations as sinners that will be judged by God. We'll turn now to Amos, prophet of justice. Amos preached primarily in northern Israel around 760 to 750 BC during the reigns of Jeroboam II and Uzziah. During this time, Israel enjoys peace, prosperity, and prestige, and the people experience lives that are seemingly contented. Let's look at Amos chapters 1 through 2, the worldwide lack of justice and love. According to Amos, all Israel's neighbors have sinned against God by mistreating one another, perpetuating international hatred. Amos first preaches against the neighboring enemy nations of Israel, and the Jewish audience probably enjoyed the message, seeing their enemies as horrible people. However, Amos next goes on to claim that Judah has broken the covenant with Yahweh. Finally, he describes the injustice immorality, and idolatry that occur in northern Israel. Due especially to the people's oppression of the weak, punishment is coming. Let's look at Amos chapters 3 through 6, Injustice in Israel. Amos lists specific ways that Israel sins. The nation has rejected God's standards, therefore judgment will overtake it. Samaria's women oppressed the poor and destroyed the needy in order to have plenty of wine. The men visit pagan worship centers, corrupt the judicial system, and oppress the poor, bribing judges to keep them or to keep from giving justice to the poor. They are rich and complacent, and they don't care about Israel's spiritual condition. The day of the Lord will bring punishment to this nation of oppressors. Though they bring sacrifices to the Lord, he wishes justice to be displayed throughout their society. Let's look at Amos chapters, or chapter 7, verse 1 through chapter 9, verse 10. Visions of coming destruction. A series of visions demonstrates the severity of the future judgment. First, Amos sees locusts eating the crops, but God relents from bringing about this disaster after he prays. Next, Amos envisions a consuming fire, but prays again, and Yahweh relents. Finally, the prophet sees the Lord measuring the people for destruction, refusing to spare Israel any longer. Judgment will devastate the land. Amos shares his message throughout northern Israel and faces opposition from the king and priests. He is even confronted by the high priest, who tells him to go back to Judah and he responds by predicting the coming destruction, exile, and slavery of the priest's family. Amos's final comments on the day of Yahweh begin with a vision of ripe fruit, meaning that northern Israel is ripe for punishment. Because Israel has become as sinful as other countries, God will punish it as if there were no covenant between them. And now we turn to Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, future hope. Amos has left no doubt about Israel and its neighbors' immediate future, and justice will cause them all to fall. After punishment, though, Yahweh will return the people of Israel to their homeland 
and the land will become fruitful again. Despite his messages of sin and punishment, Amos still envisions renewal and restoration for the covenant people. All right, we'll turn to Obadiah, uh, prophet of international hatred. This book is only one chapter long. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Hebrew Bible. It was written around 587 BC and highlights Edom's hatred for Israel. The Edomites have delighted in the disaster that befalls Jerusalem, killing refugees from the city and taking plunder. For its pride, hatred, and viciousness, Edom will be punished. Next, we turn to the book of Jonah, prophet of Israel's hatred of Assyria. While scholars have debated whether Jonah is a literal account or a parable, the focus should be on its message. Jonah's main theme is Israel's hatred of a neighbor nation, which is Assyria. The setting for Jonah is probably the first half of the 8th century BC. Jonah preaches to Assyria, which had grown weaker at the time, but would rise again later. God sends Jonah to Nineveh, which is a serious capital city, to turn the nation toward righteousness. Jonah feels no compassion for Nineveh's spiritual problems. When God calls him to preach to Nineveh, the prophet takes a ship heading in the opposite direction. Yahweh then creates a great storm, threatening the ship. Jonah confesses his sin, that he is to blame for the storm since he is running from God's command to the sailors and orders them to throw him overboard, which they reluctantly do. Jonah is swallowed by a large fish and spends a night in the fish's belly before deciding to obey the Lord. Once he reaches Nineveh, Jonah preaches half-heartedly. He mentions punishment but says nothing about repentance or restoration. Nevertheless, the people repent, fast, and humble themselves. Seeing their change of heart, Yahweh forgives them. Despite the success of his message, Jonah becomes angry and depressed over the Lord's mercy since he wanted God to destroy Nineveh. He even feels more distress over the, willing, over the withering of a plant that gives him shade than over the city's possible destruction. Yahweh rebukes Jonah, expressing his care for the great city of Nineveh. Jonah's attitude shows how Israel has demonstrated as much hatred for Assyria as Edom has for Jerusalem, as seen in Obadiah. Nineveh seems more inclined to righteousness than Israel, as it obeys God's commands. Jonah also can be compared to Israel since he ran from God, failed to obey God's word, and hated his neighbor. Now we turn to the book of Micah, prophet of hope beyond judgment. Micah preaches around the same time as Isaiah, sometime between 750 BC and 687 BC. He addresses southern Judah after northern Israel fall, also warning Judah of its sins during the threat posed by Sennacherib of Assyria. His prophecy addresses sin, but also hints at a better future for Israel. Micah begins with a declaration that God will punish Jerusalem and Samaria for their sins, idolatry and spiritual adultery, defrauding and coveting, false prophecy, accepting bribes, and fortune-telling. Thus, God promises to destroy Jerusalem. Micah then interrupts his prediction of judgment to offer the hope of restoration. Latter days, when the temple is rebuilt and people from many nations come to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh, with peace and love resulting, and hatred and injustice ceasing. A descendant of David will be born in Bethlehem, who will lead his people with God's strength, defeat Israel's enemies, and establish Israel among the nations. However, judgment must come before these wonderful future events. The Lord again voices a complaint against Israel, 
Micah describes God's actions on Israel's behalf and the fate of the dishonest, violent, and greedy. In contrast to such people, God requires mercy, justice, and humble fellowship with him. Israel's sin blocks future blessings God has promised, um, promised it, and this sin must be removed during the day of Yahweh so that restoration can begin. Both Israel and the nations have spread hatred and injustice. Judgment has become inevitable and all nations will suffer. Yet punishment will eventually lead to the redemption of Israel by separating the righteous remnant from the wicked majority. And now we turn to Nahum, prophet of Assyria's punishment. The punishment of Gentile nations must take place due to their sins. Nahum announces that Assyria the conqueror of northern Israel, will be destroyed. Nahum preaches sometime between 663 and 612 BC after Assyria has defeated Samaria and other countries and is now facing decline, soon to be overrun by Babylon. Nahum stresses that the Lord does not punish Assyria because of personal vindictiveness, as Yahweh is patient and good. Rather, punishment comes because Assyria plotted evil by worshiping idols and oppressing other countries. God stands against Assyria. Their army will collapse and their city will be looted. The whole earth will rejoice in Assyria's demise after having experienced Assyria's cruelty. Yahweh's punishment of the nations has begun. Because judgment begins with the major power, the totality of the day of the Lord becomes evident as it will affect smaller nations also. Now we turn to Habakkuk, prophet of faith amid chaos. Habakkuk prophesies around the same time as Jeremiah. Before the Babylonian invasion, he questions God about world events. Yahweh answers that judgment will soon fall on Israel and Babylon. Habakkuk's probing questions mark him as an insightful prophet. Habakkuk begins by asking why the evil persons in his nation escape punishment. Yahweh responds by informing the prophet that Babylon will punish Israel's wicked. Exile will cleanse the land of unjust and violent persons. However, Habakkuk observes that Babylon's defeating Israel leaves the wicked Babylonians prospering. The Lord reminds Habakkuk that the righteous will live by faith during the devastating days ahead, while also assuring him that Babylon will pay for its sins. Thus, the wicked never escape. God remains in control of the whole earth, and all nations who practice violence and idolatry will perish. God's answer satisfies Habakkuk. He concludes with a hymn of praise for God's deeds while pledging to live by faith. Habakkuk knows punishment for the wicked is inevitable, and it will affect foreign sinners as well as Israel. Let's turn to um, Zephaniah, prophet of universal punishment. Zephaniah writes during the reign of Josiah and emphasizes the universal scope of the day of Yahweh, which will punish individuals, including officials, royalty, and common citizens, and nations. Judah, smaller uh, surrounding nations, and even influential nations will all face destruction. Yet Zephaniah offers the hope that the day of Yahweh will rid the earth of evil people and a remnant of righteous people from all nations will survive this purge and serve Yahweh together. Babylon punishes Israel's wicked after defeating Assyria. Persia later destroys Babylon. Though each of these events represents a small-scale day of the Lord, the prophets envision a greater day of the Lord that will completely wipe out evil and lead to God's rule through the remnant. Let's turn to Haggai, prophet of temple restoration. Haggai ministers after the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation of Jews to Babylon. After Persia defeats Babylon, Persia's king Cyrus issues a decree that allows Jews to return to Jerusalem. His policy is to allow people to live and worship in their own land, believing they will serve Persia 
work gladly with such freedom. Punishment has now ended and restoration can begin. Guided by a religious, er, guided by a religious leader um, named Joshua and a civic leader named Zerubbabel, many Jews returned to Jerusalem to find a discouraging situation of the ruined city with no protective walls and the temple also in ruins. Israel struggles for 15 to 20 years with famine, economic depression, and disappointment. Haggai calls the people to prioritize building God's temple over building their own homes. They should build the new temple immediately to demonstrate their desire to serve Yahweh faithfully. The people obey the prophet as workers are organized under Joshua and Zerubbabel. After a month of labor, the people dedicate the temple. Though it is much smaller than the one Solomon built, God promises that it will one day have greater glory. God also promises to bless the people, land, and leaders, giving them peace. The temple renewal will lead to national restoration. Let's turn to Zechariah, prophet of Jerusalem's restoration. Zechariah prophesies at about the same time as Haggai. He emphasizes that Jerusalem must be rebuilt for Israel to rise again. Zechariah is somewhat difficult to understand. First, the book describes eight visions without always clarifying their meaning. Scholars also disagree about the date and authorship of the book, and a few think the last few chapters are from a different author. Further, it is not always easy to tell whether Zechariah's predictions have occurred or are yet to happen. However, the theme of Jerusalem's renewal is in focus throughout Zechariah. Let's look at Zechariah chapters 1 through 8, visions of a restored Jerusalem. Zechariah begins by explaining Israel's history. In the past, Israel constantly broke Yahweh's commands. Therefore, punishment overwhelmed the nation. Now the remnant people repent and humble themselves. Thus, Yahweh can bless them again. Eight visions show how the Lord responds to repentance. The first vision asks how long God will judge Jerusalem. God will, show, God, God will now show mercy and rebuild the temple, comforting Jerusalem as his chosen city. Another vision shows a man measuring Jerusalem, and God promises his protection for the city. A further vision predicts the priesthood's cleansing based on Yahweh's love for Jerusalem. Zechariah further says that people from many countries will come to rebuild the sanctuary. The messages of the first chapters are summarized with Prophet stating again that Israel's sins led to exile, but God will return and dwell in Jerusalem, guaranteeing peace in the city. Exiles will return home, the temple will be rebuilt, and uh, the land will become fruitful, and the people will be righteous, finally blessing all nations. Next, we have Zechariah 9 through 14, security for the restored Jerusalem. As Israel's enemies will attempt to stop the restoration process, Zechariah declares that God will fight for Israel. Regional foes that oppose Israel will be defeated. A humble Savior will come to Jerusalem riding a donkey, and God will protect the people from harm. New Testament writers refer to this passage when describing Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey during the Passion Week. Yahweh also promises to restore the whole land, and give the people good leaders. As Israel repents of its sins, God will cleanse them all. Finally, on an ultimate day of Yahweh, the Lord will defeat all Israel's enemies and rule the earth with all nations worshiping him and Jerusalem. Okay, we'll have the quick break in the video and resume with Malachi in one moment. 